Good afternoon, or good morning if you're joining us out on the West Coast. Uh, this is uh, the Washington Legal Foundation's webinar program. My name is Glenn Lammy. I'm Chief Counsel of the Foundation's Legal Studies Division. For those of you not familiar with the Foundation's work, we are a public interest law and policy firm that has been around for 41 years now. Uh, we get very active in the federal courts as an amicus and through original litigation to try to advance the uh, concepts of free enterprise and the rule of law. Uh, we're, we're very active in the space that we're going to be discussing today, and there's a great deal of resources of, of our work on our website. Uh, if you have a chance to take a look at it, it's www.wlf.org, and we're pleased to have all of you joining us today. Thanks to the inexorable growth of government in the 20th century and into this century, government contractors represent a significant part of U.S. business sales. As my colleague Greg Herbers wrote recently on WLS blog, while contracting with the government offers, quote, high financial rewards, it can also expose those companies to massive civil liability. That's what's in store for those who run afoul of the False Claims Act. Because of the law sweep, WLF has devoted considerable attention and charitable resources throughout its four-decade history to shaping its application in court and educating the public. For instance, uh, most recently we've been active in two cases involving the application of the Escobar precedent from the Supreme Court. One, one is the uh, Trinity case that's now on appeal to the, the Supreme Court. Uh, no decision yet on that one. And also the Gilead case out of the Ninth Circuit where the justices have asked for the views of the, the Solicitor General on that one uh, to see if they grant that particular case. Today's program focuses on two Department of Justice policy guidance documents, one specific to the False Claims Act and another that is of general application but will certainly have an influence on FCA enforcement decision making. Our speakers will also offer their views on the law's possible use in addressing the impacts of diversion and abuse of prescription drug uh, pain medication management. Uh, if we have any questions for our speakers during the program, uh, to the left of the screen uh, where you are watching, there's a Q&A function there. You can send the questions in at any time. We'll probably hold that idea that we get during the program until the end of the program, uh, and then we'll, I will address those to our speakers when we get to the end. Um, speaking first uh, will be John, John Basie, who is of counsel with Free Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson in its Washington, D.C. office, where he's a partner for almost 30 years. He joined the firm after five years as a trial attorney in the Civil Division at the Justice Department. He is nationally recognized on the Civil False Claims Act and is the author of the book Civil False Claims and Key Tam Actions, which is now in its fourth edition. Joining him is Douglas Baruch, who's a partner in the litigation department in Fried Frank's DC office, where he leads the firm's False Claims Act and FIREA practice. Mr. Baruch represents corporations and individuals in a variety of complex civil and criminal litigation matters, ranging from investigations and subpoena compliance to federal court litigation, with an emphasis on cases arising under the False Claims Act and FIREA. Gentlemen, if you could get started. Th thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glenn. Um, and, um, I, I want to first thank Glenn and the Washington Legal Foundation for inviting us to speak here today uh, on these topics. They're um, fascinating topics. But mostly I want to thank the Washington Legal Foundation for its support in court um, for defendants, what I think are more rational views of the False Claims Act. This is a, uh, a punitive statute that be can become debilitating to many individuals and businesses. Um, and the Washington Legal Foundation has been one of the leaders in trying to bring rational uh, interpretation of this law uh, to the fore, and um, I want to thank you all for that. Um, Doug, you want to have any, any, any introduction at all? I'm, I'm glad to be here and, and to share, a, share the table with, with, with Jack, and thanks to Glenn. Um, you've got a lot of False Claims Act experience sitting right here at this table. Uh, Jack's a, little, a lot more than my, <laughs> me. Uh, uh, Jack uh, is the dean of the False Claims Act Defense Bar. He's been my mentor at the mentor at the firm. Um, what I know, um, mostly what I know that's right, is from him. All of what I know that's wrong on the False Claims Act is it's from me. From Jack. Right. Um, you, you, many people have said that. Um, let, let's, let me just start um, by talking for a minute about um, the Granston and the Brand memos. Um, which I believe will be available to you. If you don't have them, you can just Google them. You're, they're, they're only at about 25,000 locations by now. Um, both, interestingly, were internal memoranda uh, issued within the Justice Department. Um, 
they are they became public almost immediately um, and were widely distributed. The Justice Department to date, I believe, has been invited on at least 12 occasions to show up at various seminars and sessions to speak about either the, the Grandston or the Brand Memo, and so far they have declined. Um, about a week and a half ago at a, at a session out in Las Vegas for the Healthcare Compliance Association, Michael Granston did give a little background of his memo, which I'll speak about today. Um, but the fact of the matter is, these are internal documents which have become public, but are, are extremely important to False Claims Act enforcement. Um, and we'll go through, what we're going to do is, we're going to go through first and explain what the memoranda do. Um, we're going to go through what they really say and what they do. And after we've been there, for those who aren't as familiar with it, we'll go back a little bit and explain a little bit of the history. Forgive me, I, I, I teach at a couple of different law, I teach the False Claims Act at a couple of different law firms, and I think you only understand these things if you understand the history. So after we explain what they are, we'll come back and we'll go to why the Justice Department decided it was appropriate to do that. With that, I think we'll start with the Granston memo. Um, Doug? Right, and, and even before we get there, I think it should be, we should make clear that these are relatively recent, so they're both uh, from January of this year, and the jury's still out as to whether they represent uh, a sea change in, in F False Claims Act enforcement or whether they're just going to be relegated to uh, historical footnotes. So we're, we're still waiting to see what's going to happen, so we're, we're re really um, reading, reading tea leaves here to some extent. So let's start in with the, with the Granson memo. Um, there's an image of the first page um, in the materials, uh, but it's actually an eight-page memo. It's uh, dated from January uh, 10th of 2018. It's uh, for, for folks who are not steeped in Justice Department uh, <coughs> uh, management. It's from Michael Granston, who is the director of the Fraud Section's Commercial Litigation branch, and that's the unit that has principal responsibility within the Justice Department for um, overseeing and enforcing the False Claims Act. Um, there's over 100 attorneys now in, the, in Maine Justice here in Washington that, that handle False Claims Act matters. Um, but the memo that, uh, that Michael Granson sent out is, uh, is to all Justice Department attorneys who deal with False Claims Act matters. So that goes beyond Maine Justice, and it goes, this was sent out um, as a message to um, lots of, uh, all of the U.S. Attorney's offices, because all of them have at least one or two, and many have several more attorneys dedicated to uh, False Claims Act enforcement. Um, the, the memo, as uh, you may be able to read on the materials, it's actually marked privileged and confidential. Um, it was, um, uh, I think it was intended uh, initially for that, but it leaked, as Jack said, almost immediately. Um, uh, but the point is that it wasn't necessarily intended to be uh, made public. And it probably wasn't intended, just, uh, just guessing here, to be used by defense lawyers like uh, Jack and myself to argue against interventions. But it did cause uh, what is, uh, I, I think, uh, quite a stir in the False Claims Act world and we'll talk about why. But at, at its core, the memo itself from Granston to all attorneys dealing with False Claims Act matter is a reminder to, uh, to everyone that the Justice Department has both the statutory authority and the responsibility to dismiss non-meritorious False Claims Act key TAM cases. And the key TAM cases, for, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, are the cases brought by private parties in the name of the United States. That's what this memo is about, whether and, and how to exercise statutory authority and responsibility to dismiss uh, key TAM cases that have been filed under the False Claims Act. And um, as we see it, uh, what, what, what Michael Granson is doing through his memo is telling the department that it should be using this dismissal authority much more frequently than it has in the past. So um, we have here the, uh, the dismissal, where the dismissal authority comes from. It's actually been in the statute since, uh, since 1986. And again, we're dealing with only with key TAM cases. And it's Section 3730C2A, uh, it's very simple. The government can dismiss, may dismiss, 
the action notwithstanding the objections of the person initiating the action, meaning the key TAM relator, if that person has been notified by the government of the filing of the motion and the court has been provided, the court has provided the, op the person with an opportunity for a hearing on the motion. That's it. It's very short. It's very simple. Um, there's no statutory dismissal standard in the, in the text. There's no specific grounds for dismissal in the text. There's also nothing um, about when this statutory authority can be exercised. It's not limited to the beginning of the case. It's not limited to the middle of the case. It's not even limited to uh, potentially dismissing the case when it reaches the appellate stage. Um, and there's nothing in the, in the statute itself that says the government has to move to intervene in the case in order to exercise its dismissal uh, uh, prerogatives. So there's, it's, it's very short, it's very simple, and it doesn't seem to restrict the government very much in terms of what it can and, uh, and, and, and is able to do. So uh, courts have developed a, a couple of different standards, even though the, 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 the use of this has been uh, rather uh, rare. Uh, the court has developed some standards for reviewing government dismissal motions under this section. Um, there, there's two standards. Uh, the first was developed in the Ninth Circuit in the Sequoia case, and um, there the court developed a two-part test, and it was, um, is there a legitimate government purpose for dismissal? That's test number one. And test number two, is that is the dismissal rationally related to that government purpose? So that's, um, that was one standard set. Um, then, then, then the uh, D.C. Circuit came along a few years later and specifically rejected the Sequoia standard and essentially held that the, the government has an unfettered right to dismiss a key TAM action, essentially an unreviewable right to do so. No standard, no, it doesn't have to be rationally related to a government purpose. The government doesn't have to express uh, its reasons for, for doing so. And that's, that, um, that standard, was, the, the, the Ninth Circuit standard was, was adopted also by the Tenth Circuit in the Ridenauer case, which Jack knows about uh, pretty well. Um, and well. I don't know if you want to comment on yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, I'll spend a minute on Ridner because I think it's important for everyone to understand why the Justice Department doesn't do this more. Because the interesting thing about this provision is that it's the one thing that I will call leading Quitam plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers agree on. You get it at any, you talk to the folks, and they'll say, we think the government ought to come in and dismiss these frivolous cases too, because they create bad law. So everyone, it seems, wants to get rid of these cases. So why don't they do it? And Ridner, I believe, is the best example of why. So I'll give you a little history. Ridner was a Quitam case brought against um, a number of defendants who, oper who are managers and operators at the Rocky Flats nuclear facility out in Colorado, all right, which is kind of an infamous facility. And the allegation was, was that the defendants had not had violated the False Claims Act by falsely certifying that they were providing good, decent security uh, for the nuclear plant, and they really weren't, and they, it was brought by a former head of security. And they brought it against about three or four former operators and security contractors. Um, we looked at the case and we said, well, um, we'd like, each defendant would like about eight or ten um, hot, we used to call them Q clearances. They're nuclear secret clearances because we're going to have to actually get into how the security operates at these nuclear facilities, and that requires a Q clearance. It was all cla highly classified. The Justice Department decided instead of giving us Q clearances, they decided that they would move to dismiss the case. And the rationale was, was that they would come in and they would move to dismiss, and their grounds were that they were trying to shut down Rocky Flats at the time, and that the continuation of this Quee Tom case um, would interfere with the shutdown of the reactor, uh, of, of not the reactor, of the whole facility. All right, so the Justice Department moves to dismiss. We, of course, as defendants, support them. Uh, we argue that the SWIFT standard should apply. The relator argues that Sequoia Orange should apply. The Justice Department makes an interesting decision. They make a decision 
that they will concede that the case has merit. All right, they began because they wanted to take the merits of the case out of it. They said, look, we concede it has merit. We're still going to move to dismiss this case. Um, I'm not sure they've done that recently because this is what happened. If you look at the statute that Doug just quoted, the government can dismiss if the person has been notified and the court has provided the person with an opportunity for a hearing on the motion. The district judge in, in, in Denver decided that that would be a public hearing. And for two weeks, I sat in the audience and I watched the Quitom Relators lawyer crucify the Justice Department and the Department of Energy for their decision to dismiss this case. Moreover, it was above the first page, above the full news in the Denver Post every day. And I sat there saying to myself, if I had to go through this as a Justice Department lawyer, I wouldn't move to dismiss these cases either. All right? I, I, it, it was the most embarrassing, um, debilitating two weeks that I had ever seen. And by God, the Justice Department, Don Williamson, who was the Justice Department lawyer, sat there and he took it. I mean, he, he, he smiled and he nodded and he said, um, interestingly, when we went up to the Court of Appeals, the Justice Department, we won in the district court because the shutdown was a, a, a valid government purpose. When we went up to the Court of Appeals, the Justice Department argued that, that both standards, but they say we, um, we satisfy both. The defense made an additional argument, which the Solicitor General would not make. We argued that if the district court did not dismiss the case on the motion of the government, then the Quitom enforcement was unconstitutional. We argued that if, if part of reason why the Quitom statute is constitutional is that the government has the power to come in and dismiss these cases. And if the government came in and would not dismiss them, then it was unconstitutional. Well, they, the, the, the Tenth Circuit didn't reach, or the Eleventh Circuit, the Tenth Circuit didn't yeah. reach that issue. But um, I, I just wanted everyone to understand when you, when you wonder why doesn't the government do this more, the Ridner case is the best example of why they don't do it more. Right. But at the end of the day, the Tenth Circuit, uh, again, adopted the Sequoia Orange Standard. It said that the dismissal in that case was rationally related to a government purpose of protecting classified information, and it held that uh, um, uh, there was no evidence, notwithstanding all the evidence that had been <laughs> uh, adduced at the hearing, um, that the government's dismissal decision was not arbitrary and capricious, <coughs> and so dismissed it was. So what does the, what does the Granston memo say? Um, you'll all have a chance to look at it if you haven't already. It's eight, as I said, it's eight pages. Um, but it starts with a, a list of precedents, which are actually um, examples of prior use, um, which even Granston had to uh, admit was sparing. Um, and it, but it, it notes that um, dismissal needs to be considered when it's evident that the case lacks what he referred to as substantial merit. Um, not just some frivolous standard, but if it doesn't have, the case doesn't have substantial merit, they should be looking, uh, the Justice Department attorney should be looking to, um, uh, or at least considering whether dismissal is appropriate. And uh, then he goes through bases for dismissal, all of which um, had, been, uh, used, had been used up to that point. There's seven of them. But he says that's not a, a, an exhaustive list. There are other circumstances that could arise that could, uh, could justify dismissal itself. But going through the, the seven bases, he has a section on, on each of these. The first is curbing meritless key TAMs. Um, uh, those are what he describes as Alleg uh, Ketam complaints to, with allegations that are inherently defective or frivolous, or they uh, lack merit after the, the government has in investigated. Then he goes through, um, the next one is preventing parasitic or opportunistic uh, Ketam actions. There, um, he's talking about, in, in some instances, serial relators or cases that bring no added value or um, instances in which the allegations ha are already known to the government and would result in, in, in what he refers to as an unwarranted windfall to a relator. 
And this is, this is an, the, the government has used this a lot more than anyone thinks because many times they use this while the case is still under seal. In other words, the government will go in if there's a second quitam or later and they don't satisfy the first to file bar, they will go in there and they will move to dismiss. And instead of moving to dismiss under first to file, they'll simply move to dismiss under this provision of the statute saying we have a right to dismiss it. They also use it to force quitam relators to cooperate with each other. In other words, they'll say to them, if you don't do this, um, I, I'll, we'll, we'll just move to dismiss one of them. So. Right. And then you have some practical considerations that he says could justify dismissal, preventing interference with agency policies and programs. Um, Ridden Hour is a good uh, example mm -hmm. of that. Um, uh, Trinity is one he specifically cites um, as, 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 as a basis for considering dismissal when it's, it's possible that as a result of the QTAM action, you may have the manufacturer of a much needed good or service um, exit the industry as a result of uh, bringing, bringing suit that uh, it may not be, be fair or appropriate. And then uh, he has uh, controlling litigation that's brought on behalf of the United States. That, that's what essentially he's talking about there is instances in which the key TAM action will interfere with other litigation that the government is, uh, is, is pursuing. So sometimes the government will, will inter intervene in only a portion of the claims, leaving some of the claims to be uh, litigated by the relator. If those are going on at the same time, in particular, those can really cause problems for, for the government because you can have inconsistent uh, positions being taken. Safeguarding classified information, national security interest, obviously that's uh, a written hour again there. Um, and, and what he's saying there is the mere risk of disclosure. You don't have to prove that there would be some disclosure of classified information, national security information in order to justify dismissal. The mere risk should be sufficient is what he's telling uh, government attorneys. Preserving government resources. So if you look at a case and you determine that uh, the government evaluates the case and determines there's really no damages here, um, why should the government be spending a lot of money and, and resources pursuing or, or even monitoring the key TAM relator's pursuit of that case? That, that makes a lot of sense to us. And in addition, preserving resources in those circumstances also mean, um, means uh, avoiding uh, potential discovery obligations because even if the government is not actively involved in, in pursuing the case, you still have a situation where um, there could be uh, obligations on the part of the government or agencies to have to, to uh, respond to discovery requests. And we'll talk about that in just a minute when we talk about the effects of that, the, es the Escobar effects right. on this memorandum. And then the last, the last category that he has is uh, addressing egregious procedural errors. And what I think what he's referring to there are relators who don't play by the rules and who um, expose the allegations before the government's had a, a full chance to investigate them. But then he has a CF uh, <laughs> state form. <laughs> which, which yes, is, uh, my case. <laughs> which uh, he appears to exempt. That WLF <laughs> filed an amicus brief for us, but. Um, um. So then what, 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 are the, what are the practical effects of the, the Granston memo? Um, uh, really, I think what he's attempting to do is to um, uh, develop some discipline and some rigor to the intervention decision and, and force uh, attorneys to, to focus on whether dismissal should be pursued in, in appropriate cases. Um, uh, I, I, there's other, other items here, Jack, I don't know if you want to weigh in, but uh, we'll, we'll get to the just, I think it's important to talk about the drawbacks too. And it should be clear that the Granson is not saying that this is mandatory, that you have to dismiss when one of these circumstances uh, arises. So he's not giving cl um, clear direction that they must dismiss or they must explain why they're not dismissing. He's just reciting instances in which dismissals have happened in the past where the, where the authority has been um, exercised and saying consider those in cases going forward. Um, uh, the government, of course, uh, the Justice Department gets 3% of every False Claims Act recovery, so that's uh, an incentive against uh, uh, dismissing cases uh, that, that don't, won't, won't use up a lot of resources. And then uh, a serious concern is that uh, relators are going to argue that now with this memo out there, in instances in which uh, the, the Justice Department has not moved to dismiss, notwithstanding the Granston memo, that means by definition that the, the case does have merit. 
and they're going to be signaling that to the court. And in fact, as recently as, uh, as the last couple of days in a Supreme Court uh, uh, brief, one, a relator made that, uh, made that argument. Right. It's worth just quickly um, quoting the brief of the Quitom relator in the Gilead Sciences case that I think WLF is also in. It says, um, the FCA includes an important safety valve allowing the government to dismiss a Quitom case even over a relator's objection. Um, the government considers exercising its authority when a suit interferes with the government's policy or the administration of its program. See the Granston memo. So Gilead is thus wrong to where, argue that the decision below moves regulatory authority from the federal government to private litigants. In other words, so we're starting to see the argument that the Granston memo is an indicator that the government thinks the suit does have merit. So that. Well, we're, we're lawyers, after all. I mean, that's what we do. We twist things around. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that everyone's going to have to understand that that's a big issue that we're going to be facing more and more. So we want to move on to the, the brand memo? Yeah. Do you want to? So I'll spend a minute on the brand memo, which is about one-tenth the size of the Granston memo. Um, <laughs> and in the brand memo, which you have, again, the cover page was issued on January 25 of 2018. And unlike... The Granston memo, which is really a substantive, a, 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 a procedural memo. In other words, it says this is your rights. This is what you do in order to dismiss one of these cases, and you ought to use it. The brand memo is substantive. I mean, it goes right to the heart of what is the violation of the False Claims Act. What can the government use to argue that that it's, it's that there's a, a False Claims Act has been violated? So let's let's talk a minute about that um, um, because it's worthwhile just understanding why they would need to do this. So let's go in as soon as I pull it out here to see what brand, what what Rachel Brand, who has since left the government, um, and I also think it's quite interesting that she she issues a memorandum saying to government lawyers that they can't use things like memoranda and agency guidance, and she does it by memorandum, all right? It's, it's always an interesting, I guess it's internal agency guidance, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, interestingly, it, the, the brand memorandum is not um, labeled privilege and confidential. I mean, it's just a memo to the heads of the agencies and to the heads of civil litigating components and US attorneys. Um, and um, it is part of what is called the Regulatory Reform Task Force. And since the beginning of the Trump, the Trump administration, beginning in November of 2007, with the issuance of 17, um, 17 uh, the, 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 the uh, Attorney General Sessions issued a memorandum for all components, prohibition of improper guidance documents. And what, what General Sessions was doing in that document was saying, to the Justice Department itself, not outside the Justice Department, but to the Justice Department itself, you can't tell private entities, third parties, state governments, tribal governments, private parties, that they have to behave in a certain way by guidance memo. In other words, if you're going to do that, you have to follow the administrative procedure. You either have to find a statute or a regulation that says it, or you have to follow the Administrative Procedure Act and issue a statute, and issue a regulation. That means that, and that means notice and comment. If you look at General Sessions, the November 2017 memo, it has a lot to do with um, it has a lot to do with the with the legitimacy of the Administrative Procedures Act in in determining government policy. In other words, government policy should not just be made up by by a lawyer in the Justice Department. It should be it, it should use the notice and comment provisions in the Administrative Procedures Act. So we we'll fast forward to the Brand Memo, and it's the next step in this regulatory reform task force idea that we shouldn't allow guidance. Because more importantly than the Justice Department telling someone is that she is telling the Justice Department lawyers, you cannot use guidance documents as a basis for determining that someone has violated the law. You have to rely upon either statutory language or you have to rely upon regulations properly issued under notice and comment provisions unless they're purely interpretive regulations, which is an exception under the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, 
I mean, she says, the principles from the guidance policy, that's General Sessions' guidance policy, are relevant to more than just the department's own publication of guidance documents. This principle should guide department litigators in determining the legal relevance of other agencies' guidance documents in affirmative civil enforcement. All right, guidance documents cannot create binding requirements that do not already exist by statute and regulation. And then she goes on to say, department litigators may not use non-compliance with, with guidance documents as a basis for proving violations of applicable law in, let's just leave it, False Claims Act cases. All right, it says ACE cases, but those are chiefly False Claims Act cases. Now, that's it. It's a page and a half, and a page of it is background, all right? And the other half page, it really comes down to two lines and footnote one. Because two, footnote one is really, is really the, the real importance of this is in footnote one, which is what is agency guidance, all right? I mean, what is agency guidance? And one of the reasons why that definition is so important is that, is that there are, I, I want to say millions, or probably billions of pieces of paper out there in which agencies have said what, the, what a regulated party should do. In other words, it's not all in the CFR, it's not in regulations, it's not certainly in the statute, it's in page after page after page of documents which agencies issue. In some cases, for example, at HHS, um, it's not even the agencies themselves. It's the contractors uh, who actually pay the bills. It's the, uh, it, 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 there, are, there are documents out there that, that are too voluminous to even talk about. So she then defines what agency guidance is in footnote one. And she says this, it's an agency statement of general applicability and future effect. Eh, all right, I, I, I agree with that. Whether styled as guidance or otherwise, that is designed to advise parties outside the federal executive branch, and that's the regulated parties. In other words, if you go back to Sessions, General Sessions memo, it's private parties who do business with the government, state governments, tribal governments. Designed to address about legal rights and obligations. Now, I'm going to leave rights out of this. It's really talking about legal obligations. She then goes on to say what it does not apply to, which is interesting in itself. Because it doesn't apply, according to the footnote, to adjudicatory actions not binding on others. I, I, I think what she's saying is, if it happens in litigation and it only applies to the party that's litigated, that doesn't apply. Well, the problem with that is, if you read Justice Department press releases on False Claims Act cases, they do this all the time. If they get a victory, they issue a press release and they say, this is now the law and we're holding everyone to it. And you hear it all the time. People know what the law is because another court issued a decision. So I'm not really sure what she's saying by the adjudicatory actions. Two, it doesn't apply to documents informing the public of enforcement priorities or future prosecutorial decisions, prosecutorial discretion. Okay, in other words, if they say we're gonna go after this segment of an industry, that, that's not agency guidance, but it also doesn't tell anybody what their obligations are. Three, it doesn't apply to internal directives, memoranda, or training materials for government personnel. Okay, um, I understand that, but I can tell you that when we defend, when we litigate False Claims Act cases for defendants, we are always seeking what the agency tells its own employees. Because many times what the agency tells its own employees is not consistent with what the Justice Department or a U.S. attorney or a quid tam relator is arguing in court. So in other words, we'll, we'll find much great stuff in, in what those agencies, because remember, as I always say, there are two parties inside the government to every False Claims Act case. There's the agency that, pay, that, that actually is in charge of delivering goods and services to the American people. There's the army contracting officer who buys bullets and, and weapons. 
Then there's a second government, and that's the OIG and the Department of Justice and the U.S. Attorney's offices, and they don't necessarily, those two parts of the government don't necessarily agree. Mostly they um, don't agree. Mostly they don't agree, <laughs> which is why always we try to get discovery of those folks, all right? Now, it, it, she summarizes it in one final sentence when she says, guidance documents cannot create binding requirements that do not already exist by statute or regulation. I mean, that's really what it comes down to, is that you cannot create, um, and, the, and the government should not use a party's non-compliance with agency guidelines as presumptively or conclusively establishing that the party violated the applicable statute or regulations, all right? Um, again, we really don't have much yet um, on whether this works, mostly because her concluding paragraph, very typical in all of these um, memoranda of this type, um, it, this memoranda is not intended to and does not be relied upon to create any rights, substantive or procedural, enforceable at law by any party in any matter, civil or criminal. All right, so what she's trying to say is that this is guidance to the litigators, but defense lawyers can't use it, all right? Um, which then brings up a lot of other interesting points. Um, um, let me get back to our, to our slides here. And it, um, sa it says, the memo, memo also says it only applies to future, future actions and only to the extent practical, practical to, uh, to pending matters. So that's why we haven't seen a lot of, uh, of no. cases yet on this. Uh, but, but it's important that it's not, it's not just the False Claims Act. I mean, so certainly that's the principal uh, focus, and it's, the False Claims Act is specifically called out in the, in the footnote. But it, this applies to all civil enforcement matters brought by the Justice Department. This policy is much broader than simply uh, the, the False Claims Act itself. Well, I think it's important to understand the brand memo for what has been happening in the False Claims Act over, and I'm going to leave Escobar to the moment, but there was a very important decision came down out of the D.C. Circuit about a year and a half ago called um, M U.S. XRL uh, Purcell v. MWI, which we were pleased to have filed an amicus brief um, on, on behalf of the defendant. And Purcell was really about ambiguous regulations, all right? And, you know, what we are seeing more and more in a lot of these cases is that, that the government makes a decision that it doesn't want to provide clear guidelines. Um, for example, we're seeing this in a lot of the healthcare cases involving what's called reasonable and necessary under Medicare and Medicaid. The government pays a reasonable and necessary cost. Um, the government takes the very specific position that it does not define what reasonable and necessary means because they say you have to look at that in, in every single case. The importance of the Purcell case, when that involved the definition of what was oh boy, what a, was regular a, re a regular commission that could be paid because the defendant had certified to the XM Bank that it had, not, it had paid only regular commissions. Um, it had paid only regular commissions in obtaining this contract from some from a, from some foreign government. Um, the question was, what does regular commission means? All right, and everyone was running around trying to find out how the agency had defined regular commission. And ultimately, there was no real good definition. And a substantial jury verdict uh, was overturned by the DC Circuit on that ground. But we have to think now about what agents, what, how does those Im interpretation of ambiguous regulations fit in with the brand memo and the prohibition on using agency guidance? I mean, can the agency really give an interpretation which is far beyond what the statute or the regulation or the contract actually really says post the brand memo? I don't know. And if the government thinks we defense lawyers aren't going to use that, they're out of their minds, all right? Um, they're going to make the 
argument and we're going to respond in our briefs, um, that's precisely what the Deputy Attorney General told you, Associate Attorney General, told you not to do. That's beyond the power, and that's how you should interpret these regulations. So we'll see. The, the, the other, I guess, real um, issue is whether or not it's enforceable against Quee Tom cases um, that the government doesn't intervene in. Remember, the brand memo is focused on government litigators. If the government declines to intervene, there is no, quote, government litigator formally in that case. Uh, it's being litigated by a Quitom Relators lawyer all by him or herself. Um, so the question, I'm sure that the Quitom Bar is going to argue that Brand doesn't apply to them. And to that, I would only say this. I hope you do that <laughs> because it's going to elevate the importance of brand memo. It's going to important the elevation of, 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 of non-use of agency guidance in the court's mind. In other words, I think the, the, the argument that the, the best argument for the government and for relators is this is an agency guidance, because frankly, I don't know what, based on these definitions, I don't know what agency guidance is. Well, I think there's an, there's an argument to be made, and we have, we have to move on very quickly here, yeah. but there's an argument to be made that the, the government, had they followed, had the brand memo been in effect, um, the Justice Department would not have been able to recover billions of dollars against the housing industry, the, um, the, 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 the FHA uh, lenders um, in, in those cases. All of those cases were predicated on the presumption that and the allegation that the uh, lenders were not complying with the FHA handbook, which by definition is guidance. And the, the orig loan origination uh, practices of these lenders were not in accordance with the FHA handbook. And absent that, um, uh, the use of the handbook um, in those cases, um, they, the, the Justice Department really had nothing to go on. And so there's really, a, uh, th this, this brand memo has, if you just take those cases alone, every, every top, ten, top 10 lender is still one case pending against Quicken, but every other uh, lender has been, in the, has been targeted by the Justice Department for enforcement of an agency guideline, namely the FHA handbook. And uh, most of them, I think almost all of them, have settled yeah. for substantial amounts of money. And there's a question about whether any of that was <coughs> was proper or would have been proper under the brand memo. Yeah. Let's so, skip quick, forward. Yeah. We're, at, we're at 22. Um, let's skip forward real well, real, of course, because we really want to talk about there. They're, you, you, now that we know what they do, let's just talk about why they were issued, because that's important to understand. Let's talk first about the organizational reasons. As we said before, the, 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 any case under $10 million is now delegated to the U.S. Attorney's Office. They're considered small cases. I was telling Glenn at the beginning, I settled one of these cases in 1989 for $3.5 million, and it was on the front page of the New York Times. But now anything under $10 million is considered a small case. So part of the reason for the Granston and the Brand Memo was to give guidance to the U.S. Attorney's Offices who are essentially doing many of these cases on their own. There's also, um, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of factors in intervention and settlement decisions that these U.S. attorney's offices should know about. So that was, the, or my view, the organizational reasons. More importantly, I think, are what I call the legal reasons for the Brand and the Granston Memo. And if, if we could click forward, I, I love this chart. Um, um, I love this chart. This is, I always say to people that if you know this chart, you know more about the history of the False Claims Act than 90% of the lawyers who litigate False Claims Act cases, because it goes from the passage in 1863 all the way through Escobar. And what's important is that we have to understand is that prior to 1998, with the Thompson decision in the Fifth Circuit, um, there really was no reason for either Brand or, or, or Granston, okay? Because prior to that, the kind of cases that were being brought mostly by the government, but also by Quitam relators, were cases where it was the typical sawdust included in the gunpowder and sick horses and rockets that don't work um, and upcoding patients. In other words, it was what we, what the courts call factual falsity. 
beginning in 98 and culminating with the Escobar decision in 2016, we saw the rise of false certification cases, not just applied, but both express and implied false certification cases, where qu mostly Quitom relators, but also the government, were using violations of the law even though someone had actually delivered the goods and services, I mean, the, the patient got the health care, the army got their, their missiles, but some other ancillary law was violated and there was a false certification. And with that, with this development, we saw more and more and more cases that were brought which interfere with government programs. Most decidedly, the U.S. X. Rel. Harmon v. Trinity Industries case in the Fifth Circuit. I mean, there couldn't be a greater example of a case that interfered. This was a case where the FHA and the Justice Department told the parties and the court, we think the product being delivered by the defendant is terrific. We think it, it complies with everything we want to do, and we think it's important to highway safety. And yet a jury in East Texas, a six-person jury in East Texas, issued a $660 million judgment against the defendant. And thank God that Trinity Industry had the guts to, to stand up to this. But those are the kind of cases that the Granston memo was, was targeting. It was targeting cases that really didn't have to happen before 1998 and the growth of the false certification theory of liability. Right. And one, one more point on that, and then we'll get to opioid, which is this. Because of the Escobar, remember in Escobar, what, what the court ruled was that the government knowledge and government payment decisions were critical to a decision of whether a violation of the law was material and would render an otherwise true claim to become false. The government is starting to see more and more discovery of the government in unintervened cases. Now, I can't think of anything more important than the government not wanting to have their people deposed on what they did. And in fact, if the Granston members, where people are actually now talking about tracking the, gov the testimony depositions of DOJ employees as to why they didn't move to dismiss or did move to dismiss a certain case. Do you get discovery? Michael Granston did disclose at our conference that they are fighting a case where when they move to dismiss one of these cases, someone is seeking to take the deposition of government officials as to their, the, the reasons why they are moving to dismiss that case. So this concept of government, of discovery of the government in declined cases is even one of the more compelling reasons for the Granston memo. Okay. So we'll just spend we'll just spend one minute on um, on the opioid initiative. It's, it's it really has nothing uh, to do with the, the brand memo or the or the Granston memo, but it is, it is a new initiative. It um, is uh, essentially telling the Justice Department that it should be using all resources to go after the opioid crisis, including the False Claims Act, um, where 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 appropriate. Um, and and the Justice Department is really uh, pouring resources into the into this effort. Um, there's been some precedent for going after manufacturers uh, and, and wholesalers um, in, the, in the controlled substances space. Um, there's settlements from Costco, settlements from um, McKesson. Uh, but there's a, a new initiative out there. Uh, some AUSAs have been sent uh, out to various offices. Uh, so other enforcement teams have been established. But uh, for, for present purposes, really, this, this is one of the first occasions where the False Claims Act is being used to address what is essentially a health care crisis. And there's a question uh, at the outset that many of us have as to whether that's really what the False Claims Act should be used for. Um, uh, remember, the False Claims Act is out there to protect the government against damages, monetary losses as a result of false claims um, uh, submitted to it. Um, that doesn't seem to fit the opioid crisis very well, in, in, in my view. Certainly, there, there may be occasions where there's uh, some misrepresentations. The government's paying for drugs that shouldn't have been prescribed, that, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, the primary victims are not the government in a, in a False Claims Act. Uh, in, in, a, in an opioid case, the primary victims principally are, are the users of, uh, of, the, of the drugs. Um, so the False Claims Act can play a role, but it shouldn't be a prominent one, and we're really all waiting to see 
what the uh, the outcome of this initiative is and, and how it's uh, manifested in False Claims Act cases. Yeah, but we forward. should we shouldn't kid ourselves. The, the concept of saying the False Claims Act it's one thing. It's really quiet time enforcement. Right. This is if you saw there was an article in Law 360 I think this morning um, about. Um, where a number of Quitam relators lawyers were quoted about the Armstrong settlement. Now that Armstrong settlement was originally brought by Floyd Landis as a Quitam relator. And um, the, the, in other words, the question is, will whistleblowers become more a part of, of the, of the uh, PED usage by athletes? I think that's a little of a stretch, but part of the concept of using the False Claims Act is saying to whistleblowers, you can get paid if you come forward with this kind of information. You know, I, I, that, that's just a fact of life that we have to live with. Um, um, the most powerful part of the False Claims Act is, other than its trouble, damages, and penalties, is the fact that you pay for snitches. You pay for people to come forward with, uh, with allegations of wrongdoing. Even if 80 or 90% of them are wrong, that other 10% is important. So, that's it. Any questions, Glenn? Thanks, gentlemen. We do have a few questions from our online live viewers. If you do have a question now, you're welcome to write it up there on our template and we'll ask it to our speakers. Um, one question that we got is, how does one distinguish between agency guidance and interpretive regulations assigned to agencies under the Administrative Procedure Act? Um, um, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, the brand memo does not, the, the, the General Sessions memo goes a little further on that. Um, and I would, ref I would refer the, the questioner to General Sessions' memo because he talks about interpretive guidance. Um, I, I think that, that guidance documents, uh, the definition that she gives in the brand memo is just, it, 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 it doesn't tell us much. And um, I think there's a better argument. In other words, there's a, there's a under the Administrative Procedure Act, there's an exception for interpretive guidance or interpretive regulations. Um, I know that because I lost a major case that cost the government a billion dollars back in 1974 when I was defending the government as a civil division lawyer. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think if these are valid regulations, in other words, they're valid regulations under the APA, however you get to being, whether you use notice or comment or the interpretive rule exception, if they're valid regulations under the APA, there's a better argument that they're not agency guidance. question from an online viewer so with regards to another memo that we haven't discussed, the Yates memo. Um, what changes in enforcement have you seen or do you expect to see under the Trump administration with regards to the False Claims Act and the application of the law to individuals rather than companies? Well, yeah, I, again, I think it's just probably still a little bit too early to tell. I think we're still working through the cases that were investigated and brought, and so that we're still seeing some individuals being um, being pursued and, and some resolutions uh, against individuals as a result of the, the Yates memo, whether the, they're going to continue to go after individuals going forward. Um, I don't yeah. know. It, it remains to be seen. Jack. In a recent program, I heard a government lawyer say that the word Yates is no longer used <laughs> and it's now the deputy attorney, the former deputy attorney general's memo um, because um, 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 the deputy attorney general Yates had some issues. So we don't use her word name anymore. Michael Granson did announce at our HCCA program um, that the Yates memo was under review. Um, apparently um, deputy attorney general Rosenstein has announced that all of the memoranda that the government has issued are now under review, and the Yates memo is one of those. Um, we can spend another hour talking about the Yates memo and whether or not it is um, it, it is more it's more important in its violation than 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 it being followed. Um, I mean, Doug, when you settled the, um, we, we represented a major um, um, mortgage bank uh, for a case that settled for a whole oh. lot of money. Um, and what, what, what was the settlement for the individual? There was one individual, some poor woman. Can we disclose what, what was in the settlement? It, was, it, wasn't, it was, wasn't a woman, but it, the, the settlement was, was a global settlement. We were able to get uh, essentially the Yates, Yates memo to be uh, exempted because we started the negotiations before um, it was put into effect. But it did, it did play a role in that, and I know it's played a role in, in cases going forward. It's actually been an impediment to settlement yeah. uh, in, in many instances. And I, again, that's an issue I think that many Quitom lawyers agree with. 
that 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 the Yates memo is an impediment to settlement. This is a statute that's supposed to recover money for the government, not punish people. That's not what it's supposed to do. And that's what the Yates memo. So among the many other reasons that Sally Yates should be investigated for ethics violation would be, um, would be the fact that she used this to, to punish people, and it's not intended to be punished. Those factors that you talked about from the Grandstead memo, it says in the outset that these are not, not necessarily the only factors that would be considered. There may be additional factors. Are there any that you could see going forward that might be considered by the Justice Department or U.S. attorneys other than those seven? Wow. I, I can't think of any of them. I mean, it's pretty. As a matter of fact, they're, they're duplicative, if anything, okay? I, I, I've always thought that if you can't find something in one of those seven, for example, my Rittner case probably fit under three of those, right. um, the three of those going forward. Um, I, I, I think that, that um, there, there will be there will be increased use and I think increased litigation and we'll see. But I, I can't give you any more right, right. now. Right, and, and just as a tangent to that, it's not directly responsive, but I think there's, there's concern out there that it's not gonna be applied uniformly. What one U.S. Attorney's Office considers to be um, a, a drain on resources may not be the same um, if the same facts are presented in right. another jurisdiction. And so that's patently unfair to one, one defendant in that circumstance. So. Um, there, there's a question about the uniform application across the offices and even within the Justice Department itself. I, I, and I'm, I, I apologize for this, but I thought there was something at the end of the memo that said that they want to be, in, Maine Justice wants to be informed um, when a U.S. Attorney's Office does this. Um, so I think that they're going to try to keep control over who's doing what. Um, and I'm sure that um, one member of the Senate um, Judiciary Committee is going to be asking the Justice Department um, um, for what, what, what's happening as a result of this. I would imagine that one of the sort of underlying factors that wasn't necessarily stated directly would be that, that they would be interested in getting rid of cases that are going to create bad precedent for the government to have to deal with in, in their own enforcement actions in cases that are brought by, by relators. Is that something that you see sort of underlying some of this? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, literally, if you read the Fifth Circuit decision in Trinity Industries, and I can't imagine the government ever wanting. I mean, they're going to have to live with that for a long time. And that's true of all the other, the spray, the CBS, Scaremark decision. I mean, you look at those decisions and you say, you know, what in the, what in the world was, was the Cuisan relator thinking by, by, by prosecuting these cases? I mean, and now taking it to the Supreme Court, that's got a good chance of success. One thing that we didn't talk about is that there obviously are 50 False Claims Acts at the state level, or at least I'm not sure if that, there's that many, but there are some. Have you seen state attorneys general acting a little bit more aggressively in, in getting rid of cases that have been filed under state False Claims Acts or, or, or intervening and dismissing um, or has that not quite got there yet? We actually um, got involved um, for the chamber um, in supporting um, the state attorney general in Florida moving to dismiss a case. I think it involved Honeywell, if I'm not wrong. It's been a while. But we filed an amicus brief on behalf of the chamber um, supporting them, and that case was eventually dismissed. Um, I do not, I mean, we for purposes of the book, which covers both the federal and the state false claims laws, um, I don't remember seeing a whole lot of state activity except for that case in Florida, and that was heavily litigated because the language wasn't quite as strong as it is in the in the federal statute. But um, I think the state attorneys, uh, state state attorneys generals are different. As I said, no no state attorney general wants to be state attorney general. Uh, they want to be governor and or senator and. The best way to do that is to file a lot of false claims act cases. So I don't think we'll see as much activity in the state level as we will in the federal level. But, but most state false claims act are modeled off the federal yeah, false claims act, so they have the same dismissal provision in there and the same option to, to do that. Uh, one final question I have for you. You had said that defendants can't necessarily use the, the Grantson memo in, in, to help their own clients, but I imagine that there would be opportunities to talk to um, U.S. attorneys and, and line prosecutors at justice. Um, is that something that, that you imagine will be occurring? Defense attorneys will go in, in the same way that, a, that a, 
uh, uh, counsel for somebody where there's a case where it's through the uh, Solicitor General that has to file a brief or not file a brief, there'll be yeah. meetings, yeah. those uh, sort of things. Let me, let me just answer that real quickly. Um, I'm not sure we, I don't know that we'd be able to use the Granston memo in court, but we're certainly right. using the Granston yeah. memo um, in arguing against uh, intervention and arguing against proactive uh, uh, decisions to, to dismiss cases that are under investigation. So we are using it and we'll continue to use it for that purpose. Yeah. I think Doug's point is important. The, the criteria, those seven criteria, in the, in not only are basis for dismissing a False Claims Act, a, a Quitom case, they're also grounds for not intervening in a False Claims Act case. And, and it's not inappropriate, I think, to say to an assistant U.S. attorney or to a Justice Department lawyer, you know, this interferes with agency policy. This, this will cause enormous, this is going to, we're going to have to take 20 depositions of agency employees in order, if, if, in order to do this case. So... I think it has use beyond in court, yeah. and we'll, we'll we'll find a way to make sure it gets into our into our briefs as well. It just uh, whether whether we can actually enforce it through uh, court yeah. pleadings is another thing. So, as most people know, that through FCA litigation, there's a, these suits are filed under seal. <coughs> so, how does that affect your ability to to advocate for your clients on on behalf of of these sort of, of situations where they might the good justice department might want to get rid of the case. We almost always, if the case becomes serious, you almost get what the order government calls an order of limited unsealing, where they're allowed to show the case to us and the complaint to us, usually redacted to, to take the name of the relator out. But there's always, we generally, if we don't get that, um, we get something close. And we can always, we always argue off of that. I mean, it, it's, it's if, if they're that far, if we're so far that we got an order of limited unsealing, it's unlikely that they're move, gonna move to dismiss it because they've now begun investigating it. Um, but we'll, we'll see. But we almost always get to see the Queen Tom complaint un, while it's still under seal by these orders of limited unsealing. Or, or they'll tell us what, what, what they're interested in pursuing, what the, what the general allegations are. So we, we have our opportunities even while it's under seal. I see there's no more questions from our online audience. So I want to thank you both for joining us today. Very lively hour. I think we got through a lot of information and analysis. Uh, if, if you got to the program a little bit late or you have colleagues that might be interested in watching it, this will be available on our uh, IBM channel as well as our homepage uh, soon after this as an on-demand file. Thanks again, Jack and Doug, for joining us. Today. Thanks, Glenn, for inviting us.